Welcome to the China Mina Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Fulton, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a political scientist at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. China's growing power and influence has inspired a lot of work that concentrates on what happens to the international system when a rising power approaches the level of the country or countries that dominate. Will the rising power be satisfied with how the political and economic system works and support it, or will it be dissatisfied and try to change the rules and norms that shape how the system works? With China, it's safe to say that on some issues, they've been somewhat satisfied, and on others, they're clearly less so. And in recent years, we've seen a lot of Chinese initiatives that show us Beijing's preferences for global order. Things like the Belt and Road Initiative, the Digital Silk Road, the Health Silk Road, and more recently, the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative. To help us understand what all these initiatives mean, I can't think of a better guest than Nadej Roland. Nadej is a senior fellow for political and security affairs at the National Bureau of Asian, Asian Research, where she focuses on China's foreign and defense policy and the changes in global dynamics resulting from the rise of China. She's the author of the first great book on the BRI, China's Eurasian Century, Political and Strategic Implications, the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as several excellent reports for the NBR. Nadej, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Of course. I'm glad you could you could uh, make the time for us. So, Nadej, you've written a lot of great work over the past few years, but for the purposes of today's show, I want to focus on one that you published nearly three years ago for NBR, uh, China's Vision for a New World Order. Before we get into that, the idea of global order uh, can be pretty abstract for some some people who aren't political scientists or, or professional political analysts. So when, what are we talking about when we talk about global order? Right. So I I have skipped uh, that class when I was in college and university. So <laughs> I'm going to, and I'm not a political scientist by training. You know, I've spent most of my career into government. So I'm approaching this from a very sort of pragmatic and simple-minded way. Uh, to me, uh, one way to, to explain it, or the way I define it is, the world order is what gives shape and, and structure to um, the way states interact with one another. It's sort of simple, but it's in any form of community, you have some rules of engagement or, and some, some things that are going on. And it's the same at the international level between states. And um, since the end of the Cold War, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, we have been living in what the U.S. has tried to build as a as an international order, as a liberal international order. Um, they have tried to to create this system that would comprise mostly liberal democracies that would interact uh, according to a certain sets of rules and norms. Um, including, for example, free trade, uh, respect for human rights, um, the resolution of uh, disputes through um, through um, negotiation or peaceful resolution of disputes, uh, elected governments, ru- rule of law, international law. So set a set of, of, of uh, principles, rules, and norms um, that underpin this broader system that's that's what we're living in right now or partially living in right now because there are some countries that don't that don't fit this description yeah a lot in my neighborhood here in in uh, the middle east Uh, i think that's a really good description because you covered a lot of the main points that i would talk about with my students when we're talking about this stuff you know how um kind of the social aspect of it, right? How, how countries have to find ways to, to work together. And the rules and norms, I think, are really important, right? And of course, these get set typically by countries that have the most influence. And I think you're right. Since the end of the Cold War, my entire adult life, it's been, you know, the U.S. has been the center of this order. And I think a lot of countries have benefited from that, right? I mean, you could see countries like North Korea or Iran or Iraq, obviously, that, that have chafed under this or been dissatisfied or felt excluded, but China, I think, has largely been the beneficiary of a lot of this. 
Um, it has I think been, but a at lot the same benefits. Yeah, absolutely. I think it has been, but at the same time, uh, China has, um, from the start, been very worried and concerned about the order itself because um, it really is antithetical to uh, to the principles under. Uh, on which the, the regime, the Chinese uh, Communist Party regime, uh, is being built. So, you know, um, I would even argue that for the government in Beijing, the liberal order is actually a matter of of, of existential threat because it promotes the idea of. Uh, individual freedom, respect from human rights, and looking at uh, f- um, the world in, in free flows and exchanges. And that's the opposite of what the party state wants for itself inside of China, but also on the global stage. You know, it wants to retain a certain degree of control over economic forces, over its society, um, over its security. Uh, over its internet, uh, etc. So we have very different visions of uh, what the world should look like uh, for themselves, but also for for the entire architecture that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's that's fair, and I think you know there have been a couple of guests at different points since we've been doing the show over the past few months. Um, one was Don Murphy. I don't know if you've seen Don wrote a really book on a really good book on China's approach to the global south. And she makes a distinction of the rules-based order and the liberal international order. And when we talk about the rules-based, I think that's something the PRC says, hey, we like that. If there's rules, we can figure out how to use these to our advantage. We can go into the United Nations and rally support for things that matter to us and get a X number of countries to agree, and this works in our favor. And I think they like that. They like you know, how you can you know, resolve trade issues or whatever. But the liberal international part of it, I think, is where they get really uncomfortable. And I think they're not alone in this. I think a lot of countries don't really like the liberal bit in, in how it works. Yes, I, I think that's a very good way of, of explaining it. You know, the rules can be, they don't need to be necessarily liberal rules. I mean, in theory, you could have a, an architecture, you could have institutions and organizations but then the rules and norms and values that underpin those could not necessarily be uh, liberal ones um, as the ones that I have just enumerated. You could have rules that are mostly uh, status, mercantilist, uh, power-based, rather than you know, openness, transparency, uh, um, effort to limit corruptions and things like that. And I think this is... This is where the moment that we're living in is so important because we realize um, that instead of socializing, I think that's the term that political scientists have used, socializing uh, countries like Russia and China by incorporating them into that liberal system, Um, what what has happened is that they, those authoritarian countries have rejected and have been re- resilient against change, against transformation, against socialization. So in other words, I think the belief was if, they're, if we're incorporating them into the system, they will see how beneficial it is to them and they will want to become more like us. They will want to transform their economies. They will want to transform their political system. They will want to transform their approach to governance. And none of this has happened because, and especially in the case of China, which is the the country that I'm more focusing on, uh, because none of these areas are areas in which the party, the Chinese Communist Party wants to be transformed. They have their own vision of what matters to them, of what is important for their interests and um, liberalization is not one of one of those uh, important things to them. Yeah, that's, that's totally fair. I think we often project what we would like to see on the party. Um, but even, you know, when I think back to the good old days, you know, of the Hu Jintao or the Jiang Zemin years when it kind of looked like the trajectory was taking them 
in a, 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 an arc that was more compatible with, I think, what some countries would have preferred from uh, from the Western perspective. Um, you could see, you know, that as I, I know that the party has clamped down a lot over the past decade, or even you know over the past twelve years or so, to, to clamp down on this. But you can see a lot of pressure from below, and I think that's why the Xi Jinping years have been so so um, strident. Is that there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the party, that there was a lot of pressure from people in China to start to move in a more open direction. Um, I just, so I kind of see what they've been doing as a response to that. I think it's, I would date it back much, much earlier than, I mean, Xi Jinping, it's, it's both um, a, a lot of change, but mostly an acceleration or, or an intensification of trends that were very visible for, People who were, you know, trying to understand it uh, for what it was, and not by projecting things onto a reality that was not exactly what we wanted. Um, but you know, you can. I, I've, I'm not sure. I want to go into too much detail because I'm not sure whether we're going to lose your audience uh, for that. But you know, in the Jiang Zemin era, he he. He had this idea of the three represents, uh, which was a way to integrate um, uh, class like uh, classes that are not the ones that usually Marxist regimes think about, including entrepreneurs and business people inside of the party. And that, what to me, that was the first step into trying to adjust with the changes that were. Um, uh, starting to appear in China, um, while at the same time keeping control over those people and production forces and social forces. And in the Hu Jintao period, there's a, I mean, going back to 2008, 2009, there's a lot of clampdown clamp happening in China already. I mean, talk about Tibetans and, and people in Xinjiang and, you know, remember those periods. And an effort also to to, um, um, to 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 control the society a bit more. Two thousand and three, uh, also in the Hu Jintao period, this idea of China's uh, peaceful rise. So these are all indications of transformations that are already happening much much earlier on than twenty thirteen. Yeah. So I was working on a paper earlier this year, and I had to go back and read reread a lot of that peaceful rise uh, work and it just seems mm. so quaint it you know it, it seems like a totally different era um, <laughs> but also yes but no you right, can I, see uh, it's it's also so, sorry I'm interrupting but I think there's no. a lot of uh, re -pur repurposing of things it's like the party doesn't seem to ever discard anything it's it it adds up layers and layers it it builds on layers of the past and it repurposes some of those older uh concepts or sometimes the concepts change but the um the the substance of what's there is the same and i feel like you know you in your introduction you were talking about the global security initiative the global development initiatives um, and when you look at it, okay, it's another term, it's another formulation, it's another brand. But if you start to look at what has appeared as a substance, what makes the substance of it, it's just a repurposing of things that have appeared earlier. Uh, it's, uh, it's usually a, an evolution on the same themes, really. That's actually a great segue because I wanted to ask about these two things. Um, I, I always notice a pretty significant gap between China announcing these big initiatives and you know the Western media or Western governments, you know, catching up on it. Um, and with the Global Development Initiative, when this was announced, I didn't see really much in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian. Um, I don't think people were really paying a whole lot of attention. And then the Global Security Initiative was. What this April, I think, April yes. twenty two, they announced it, and yes, still right. I haven't seen a lot of really um, sub substantive um, analysis of it. It seems that a lot of people are, are not really paying attention. So, 
Could you give us a, a brief overview of these two initiatives and what they're about and why they're important? So it's not really surprising that people haven't really paid attention because it's 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 exactly what you're saying. You know, the Beijing will launch these things and then sometimes they will not define it very clearly for yeah. a broader audience. So the thing is that uh, Xi Jinping announced them um, six months apart, uh, starting with the global um Development initiative, development, I think yeah. it was in yes, yep. in September 2021, and then the security initiative uh, in April 2022. Um, but then it's it sounds more like it's um, uh, it, it's it's something that is out there, but we don't know the exact content of of it it's a bit both of them are a little bit nebulous uh yeah. and even in in the the official announcement we're it it's very poor so far in in details so the only thing that we can say or that i can personally say about both of them now it's that first of all it's a sort of formalization of china's global intentions the global mm -hmm. initiatives. So, you know, for a while, I think many observers were still thinking that China had only limited regional ambitions, limited to its own region, to East Asia. And both the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, the, the Belt and Road Initiative to me was really the, the, that critical point in time where it was clear that China was not envisioning itself solely as a regional East Asian power, but as a global one. But since then, you know, there have been uh, recurrent official pronouncement positioning China at the center stage uh, of the international arena, uh, taking even the lead of the reform of global governance. So, and now global security and global development. Um, so the ambition is really not just regional. That's that's just a a a, a very clear marker of Be Beijing's um, uh, and global ambitions. But then it's also about burnishing its its credentials um, uh, on the on the global stage. Um, so I would be cautious about discarding both initiatives as empty slogans. You know. I've heard so much about BRI being an empty slogan, uh, just a label on things that were happening before, and it turned out not to be the case. I think I would really caution every, everyone who thinks about these things, just like empty announcements. Uh, it's just that the way the party state operates, um, and, and that was really obvious with the Belt and Road, there are these announcements, and then it's sort of an internal collective effort to try to figure out how this is going to be concretely um, fulfilled, implemented, the exact directions that this is going to take. So it's a different way of strategizing. It doesn't mean that it's less efficient or that it's... Uh, it's stupid and empty. I think it's just a different way of, of, of doing things. Um, so I think more details might emerge in the, in the next few months. For Belt and Road, between the official announcement uh, by Xi Jinping in late 2013 and the publication of a white paper in March 2015, there's a whole year and a half where details were really scarce about what it was exactly. People were... We, and that's why people were starting to say it doesn't amount to much, and yet. Yeah. I was as you're describing this. I was thinking a lot of things, and one was I was listening to comedians recently about how they how they work. And one guy says he'll often write the punchline to a joke and then figure out how to get there. And <laughs> that's kind of what I think about when I think about BRI, because you're right. Like in 2013, there were these big announcements. And then in 2015, the white paper came out. And I remember reading something where basically every ministry official all throughout 2014 had to, you know, make the thing, right? Like, okay, this mm -hmm. is what they want. Now, how are we going to do it? Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah. 
one of the things that struck me when you're describing it is um, just just this. Like I keep hearing from kind of BRI skeptics who will say, like, you know, this is this thing isn't working. The debt trap narrative has has undone it. Um, I think its vagueness is its strength because it can be anything. You know, looking in the region here, when when a lot of the development projects weren't happening or or trade started to decrease because of COVID, then the people to people side gets amped up, right? That that people to people co-op um, prior, um, cooperation priority becomes the focus, and they can say we're still yes. doing Belt and Road, we're doing it through, yeah. you know, um, sharing information and and, and you know and educating. health cooperation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's true of this. So, like, I, I just pulled up. I, I've been working on a, a report on the GSI GDI. That's taking forever because, for reasons you're describing, it's it's a very kind of nebulous. You know, for the GDI, there's six priorities: staying committed to development, people-centered approach, benefits for all, innovation-driven development, harmony between man and nature, results-oriented actions. That's the right. GDI at this point. Yeah. What does yeah. that mean, right? Yeah. yeah. It can be anything. It's very lofty. It's very lofty. It's always it's always like that. You know, it's very general. The direction, it's just a, giving a sense of direction. And then mm. you're right. It's uh, that I like that parallel with the comedian, although in this case, I don't think it's any matter for it's not so funny. for laugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, but yes, it's 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 how it how it works and people in the ministries but also like uh the the academic world and 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 experts are all called into uh that f collective effort in trying to find ways to make this happen the thing with bri is that because it was it was lofty it also had from the beginning it had those uh very specific both specific and and broad pillars about you know People just latched on to this idea that this was about infrastructure building. Infrastructure, yeah. Just infrastructure. And then forgot about the other components of policy coordination, uh, trade, and financial integration, and people to people. But it's, it's yeah. really a, a, full, a full program of how you create an order, like a system. Yep that will prevail and, and create those new interactions between countries and between countries and China. So this Belt and Road is really a way to support a vision for a new world order that is China-centric. So from, from concrete to more abstract. Yeah, so I, I just about two months ago, I was talking with somebody and they said, yeah, Belt and Road you know, I asked somebody about, you know, uh, these projects that are linking ports around the Arabian Peninsula. And this person was quite dismissive and saying, you know, the Belt and Road is a toxic brand. Nobody talks about it anymore. It's over. And, you know, I, I wasn't quite so um, cavalier about dismissing it. And then we saw just, so we're recording this uh, December 21st, uh, you know, two weeks ago, Xi Jinping was in Saudi. And when you look at all the joint communiques, the Belt and Road was front and center of all of it. You know, when they're talking to the Saudis about things they're going to cooperate on, they're saying, how are we going to merge the Saudi Vision 2030 with the Belt and Road Initiative? And, you know, so that clearly isn't going away. This is still the, I think, the main pillar of a lot of what they're trying to do. And I agree, I think there's a normative component to this that doesn't get thought about enough. And you can see that with the GSI and the GDI as well. Like it, they, they seem very um, vague or very general but when they talk about replacing the, just going back to what you were saying earlier about how these norms and values are embedded in order, and I think what China's creating is is an order that embeds different values and different norms, and that's attractive to a lot of countries in the global south that never really yeah. got the good end of the liberal international order, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's also what China is, frankly, playing on because uh, it, you know, this offer that China wants to share with the rest of the world, the China solution, uh, is is an alternative, and it, the way uh, China presents it to the world is um, um, something that. 
something that will provide solution for others and that could provide solutions in places where the liberal solutions have not done. And, and, and this is the essence of, so there are two, at the two sources of dissatisfaction uh, for for Beijing uh, with the current way, uh, the current order, or the current way uh, that the world is organized. Uh, the first one is that currently it doesn't give enough space for China um, because it gives. They feel like uh, their material power has grown and the balance of power is shifting towards Asia and China in particular. And yet the order as it's organized still gives too much weight to Western countries and it's, and specifically to the U S but, but um, so it doesn't reflect this change in the, in the balance of power. And the second one is that um, they, they criticize it by saying um, it's an, it's, it's unreasonable. So the first part is unfair. It's, it's, it's not a fair share given to emerging countries and specifically to China. And the second one, it's unreasonable because it doesn't provide, it doesn't solve the world's most fundamental problems of peace and prosperity. And actually they invert it in saying that the liberal principles and values and the d- promotion of democratic norms are actually bringing chaos rather than peace. And so that the the way China has you know, developed, evolved, both in terms of stability and economic growth is a viable alternative. And so they reject uh, the idea of universal values and the fundamental individual rights from which everything else in the liberal order stems from liberal means liberty i mean the, the the really core of it is the individual freedom from that you if you the individual is free he is free to uh to go to enterprise to go and get informed to go and vote for his government and decide who is going to represent him etc etc everything falls into place um so it's a, it's a very uh uh, different way of thinking about how uh, to organize those interaction and, and, and the world itself. And because of China's own path and, and model, they think that it's a, not only a viable solution for other countries, but a superior model. And so most of the narrative that China is now projecting in the emerging and developing world is, you know, you, you, sh- you should try this one. We could be an inspiration for you because the other solutions haven't worked that well for you. So as an inspiration, I've actually, that's been another recurring theme on this show, talking to people from the Middle East who know about China and say, we don't see it the same way, you know, the Europeans or the Americans see it. We don't see it as a threat. We see it as an inspiration. How did you go from being a poor, underdeveloped country to this, you know, economic power. Like we, we want to do this too, because IMF solutions or world bank solutions haven't helped. Um, and when you're describing this, I was just thinking in your report, there was a, a quote from Fu Ying, who was the, the chairperson of the, um, national party Congress foreign affairs committee. And she gave a speech in London, uh, five or six years ago. And she's saying, you know, the rules-based bit we like, you know, we're part of that. We're in the UNSC. We, we, we want to continue with that. But she actually criticized the liberal order, saying, you know, this perpetuates Western dominance. It's not able to solve the world's most serious problems. It often exacerbates the world's most serious problems. And, you know, then saying, yeah, why not try what we do? It might be, you know, an alternative yes. for you, right? Right. But what what the what this narrative um, hides or obfuscates is that China arrived to this point precisely because it let it reformed and open and it let those you know market forces and select liberalization take hold um, so 
you cannot say, you know, look at us, we have achieved all this because of our exceptional solution that is a, outside of the liberal order, because it's not entirely true. It actually allowed for some elements of liberalization to, you know, it's the, it's the image that Deng Xiaoping used, we need to open the window, even though there are going to be flies coming in. Um, we, we need to have this openness so that we can att attract capital, investment, um, technology, sharing, etc., which China did. Um, so China's success is not just based on the, on the party's specific solutions for itself. It actually has incorporated uh, some of those liberal norms and values. And it's because of that that it's been beneficial to, to China's development. So if, if you just say, look at us, we are controlling our economy, you, we're controlling the market forces, we're controlling our society, we're controlling uh, the information space, and we're successful, I think this is not a, it's, it's a, in, <laughs> a lying publicity. In French, we say, in fausse publicité, in publicité mensongère. You're just, you're just not telling the exact truth about what you're selling, right? So I think in you know for for countries um around where you are based uh in the middle east this is something you need to start understanding better where does the success of china come from exactly and what constitutes this success and then you can see that there's there's a lot to it that it's more about actually the liberal elements of it that has allowed for china's success now those are all great points. And I think, you know, I was in Cairo a few months ago, and when people were talking about China, it was, they used a lot of superlatives, but they didn't really know much about China. You know, they, they would talk about how it respects our sovereignty and it's the, the world's greatest economic power and rising political and security power. Um, but when you ask the follow-up questions, you know, okay, if it's a great military power, what, what is it doing in the region security wise? And, you know, oh, we don't know, you know, like a lot of it is just the, the assumption, right? They're hearing, reading the headlines and just projecting this hundred foot giant is, is how they see it. It was interesting that when they were talking about China, there seemed, it seemed very transactional. They liked the way China was seen to be st standing up for the global South, that it was that it was you know using the, this new narrative of of how they would like to see the world work, but there was nothing beyond that appreciation. There was nothing in material terms like what are they actually doing to to work on it, um, and like you say, the, they need to know more about it because there very few people in the region speak Chinese. Very few people are studying Chinese polit um, politics, culture. It's it's really a blank slate for a lot of people, and I think it doesn't really have a lot of natural allies or partners, you know, because I think a lot of countries maybe admire what's done economically. They, they admire the transformation, but you know, if you said, would you rather, do you want to live in, you know, under the party that's going to lock everybody down for a couple of years and then open up and everybody gets COVID is, is that what you want? And a lot of people don't find that especially attractive. Yeah. It's that it's also, you know, from a, uh, from an outsider's perspective, it's what is it that China has to offer for for yourself? You know, what how would that serve your own interests, national interests, whether you are in Iraq or in Algeria? You know, what is it that you can get out of it? And I think here too, you, there's a, a very fundamental difference in between um, the way Beijing and maybe Washington see their relationship with those countries. I mean, at the principle and theoretical level, I think that the, the, the approach from Beijing is we're basically favoring a very elitist approach um, without much concern for uh, the people. Um, so it's, it's about creating um creating a lot of uh of 
yeah, cr creating more um, depth and strength of uh, government to government, uh, political elites. Uh, and when I say political elites, it's not just the politicians, but also the business communities, people who have the power. Whereas I think the American approach, again, in theory, it's not necessarily always the case in the reality and how it translates. But I think there's still a, an effort to engage with civil societies with, you know, m m it's more a people-based approach. I mean, it's a, even democracy is about the people uh, first. Um, so for countries in, in the Middle East, I think this is also what you need to think about. Is it something that will benefit a certain portion of the government elites or is it something that's going to benefit the people and the entire country because if china wants to come and say okay do like us and uh we're going to invest in this project and by the way we don't really going we're not going to control whatever you're doing with the money and if 10% of it is going to your own pocket. Or if you're taking people away from their land, or if you don't respect liberal laws. I mean, you know, sometimes I feel like in, in discussions I've had with people from emerging and developing countries, they're always like, yeah, but development is what we need. You know, human rights is secondary. Uh, um, what what human what does human right do when you don't have anything to eat or you know to uh, warm yourself or something like that? But in reality, I think the human rights are really fundamental because if you don't let the people um, be entrepreneurial and decide and and have a say in what is best for them, then none of this is going to happen to them because the money and the food and the heat are going to go to the elites only because they're corrupt. And anti-corruption is, is also a matter of transparency, which is also a matter of rule of law, which is attached to, again, liberal ideas and norms. Mm. So if you look at it this way, there's, there's a lot of things that if you look deeper into what the China solution versus the... Uh, the liberal solution brings there's, there's a lot of food for thought i think yeah the middle east like as a political scientist this is a really interesting laboratory you know because you can look at you know this is really the nexus of where this stuff comes together you know they've got these long-standing relationships with the us um but these are kind of elite bargains you know government to government bargains it's mostly based on interests um, there's quite a big gap between the publics and then you look at, but, but, you know, as you described, the U S does have these ideals that it, it would like to think it, it tries to uphold in the region. Although, you know, experience doesn't always prove The reality is out. different. Yeah. Yeah. It is very different, but China comes in and says, yeah, that stuff isn't what we're about. We're like you described, we're, we're about building states, you know, cause a strong state can, can solve these problems. And I think when you hear them, going back to the, the GDI or the GSI, when Chinese analysts or politicians talk about Middle Eastern security issues, they always say, they always frame it as it's, it's about development. If you can build functioning economies, if the state has capacity, if people have jobs, they're not going to be inspired to join, you know, a terrorist group or a political Islamist group that tries to overthrow the government. And, you know, all that stuff goes away and you get, you know, a functioning government with a good economy and a happy middle class, and you don't need an army in this case because you've got, you know, stability. And that's kind of the way they frame it. Um, my issue with that is, okay, well then, why isn't that working in Xinjiang or in Tibet? You know, if, 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 if it's all a matter of just providing economic stability, then people won't fight against the state, right? Yes, I think what really is missing from this equation is that human beings are fundamentally idealists. I mean, look at what's going on in Iran. Uh, I think, you know, here you are in a system, I mean, I'm 
again, I'm just observing it from the surface. So please forgive me if I'm not qualifying anything in a, in a proper way. But uh, this is a system that is what you're talking about. It's a strong state that has control uh, over its population and has had it for a long time. Uh, and yet you see this movement. Um, it I've, I've heard um, uh, an Iranian woman recently describing it so well that it just touched me uh, to the core, which was uh, they ha- the population and the women in Iran have been prevented from having access to freedom uh, for the, their entire life since, since they were born. They were not taught uh, what democracy and liberal values were, and yet they felt them inside of them very deeply, and they're basically exerting their fundamental universal human right to uh, to say no to tyranny uh, and to demand freedom. So I think, um, and I don't know if these women really think about having a job or, 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 you know, having food on the table. At this moment, what matters more to them is their ability to be free and to, 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 and that's an ideal rather than a very material based interest. And I think the what what is out from the from the equation, in what you describe from those conversations that people have uh, in the region when they talk with China, is this ideational element. You know, you need to have, and and this is a it's sort of a undercurrent force in the in the human being psyche, really. You know, if you had to choose between uh, living in, a, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people would would answer and say, "Well, I'd rather be, you know, in a stable, not censored uh, uh, <laughs> country where I don't need to make any decisions for myself, and I'm just following what the government wants, as long as I can have access to this or that." Um, Maybe I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I don't know either. I mean, it's it's <laughs> easy to look around the region and see extreme examples where you could say, you know, if you look at, you know, Syria or Iraq, and you could see these polar extremes where you know they had a functioning state and people lived in fear and they didn't have any freedom, but they had a degree of stability or security, and then the state didn't work and they they lived in utter chaos. And, you know, given those extremes, it's pretty easy to say, you know, obviously I'd rather not live in chaos, but most of the region's not in those extremes, right? So it, it becomes a, a much more abstract question, I think. Um, I, I was thinking of somebody I, I, I was talking to in the region and, and this person was in a country that had swung from a, um, to a more authoritarian turn in, in over the past decade. And he said, when he sees his government talking with China, it makes him nervous because when you spend a lot of time with authoritarians, you start to normalize authoritarianism and all those, you know, values that you might want to see um, that give you a little more freedom or a little more opportunity, just start getting shredded a little faster. It's interesting. uh, But it's, I don't think it's um, restricted to, countries in the region. You know, right now, um, the foreign minister for, of Australia is, I think she is in China or she is going to China soon. And there's there's a lot of controversy about this trip because people in Austra- some people in Australia are saying she's l- legitimizing a, a dite- dictatorial and genocidal regime. You know what? What is the urgency of going there and visit? And isn't that opposite to what Australia stands for in term in terms of values? So I think this is it's it's exactly what you're saying. I think um, as China is getting more and more out of the out of the closet in what its real nature is and what it stands for and what it rejects and has more power 
to pursue those objectives without um, um, pretending otherwise or pretending to be s some other form of government or 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 um, or, or shaping or, or our perceptions in a, in a way that makes our, us look elsewhere um, is are we going to be even democracies are they going to be able to continue to interact with Beijing in the same way they used to um, and that's something that European countries are also um, I think people are willing to go back very quickly to Beijing because Beijing is is seemingly giving some uh, signals that it wants to be more amenable or more charming, less wolf warrior-ish or, or less aggressive. Uh, and people want to go back because they still feel like, you know, there's some business to be done and there's some dialogues to be held. And, um, and then the question really becomes whether this is, this is something that helps uh, Beijing uh, hone its own legitimacy. Yeah, well, I think you you hit right to the heart of the problem because you know a lot of the problems that we face globally requires China, right? Like when you're describing Europeans going to Beijing, my first thought is Russia and Ukraine, right? Obviously, yeah. they, they want China to do something to help. Well, um, good luck with that. Yeah, bon chance. I don't uh, <laughs> see it happening, but but I think on on most big issues, we we see China as you know an actor we have to try to engage. And um, which one are we going to get? I think, to their credit, I hope they realize in Beijing that the past couple of years, this very strident, aggressive tone has really not done them any favors. Um, so whether it's you know wolf warrior in sheep's clothing, and they try to. Uh, you know, just mask, you know, don't say the, the quiet part out loud anymore. Um, and then just try to rebuild some of those relationships. But I know uh, I'm, I'm from Canada and, and we've had a pretty big shift in how we've seen China just over the past 10 years. And I think the same can be said of the Australians, the, the British, uh, you know, most liberal democracies have had a pretty hard time navigating that relationship. Uh, I guess if anything gives me hope, it's just that people in China aren't especially happy either. And, and you know, the government, like we saw with the zero COVID policy going, maybe the government will have to be responsive if the party wants to stay in power. Um, not that I think it will change who they, you know, the, the underlying nature of what the party does or wants, but uh, I think more than anything, they're about self-preservation, right? Yes. I think the, this really the main theme that uh, can be, learned and traced back several decades is the resilience of the party in, in its aims. And the first one being its own survival and ability to perpetuate its own power. And then there is some little flexibility about how to do exactly that and uh, the ingredients that you can use to, go, to, to achieve this objective. So you can be um, you know, pursuing economic growth and giving more material comfort to your population. You can use ideology. You can use repression. Um, a little bit of the three, more of one, less of the two. I mean, this is these are the the ingredients that they have used to to sustain their power, just like any other authoritarian country would. Um, but but what really matters is this the sustainability of the one party rule, um, and then it's this perpetual um, reinvention or ability to, as I was saying before, to build on the layers of the past without rejecting any of them. Like Xi Jinping has not rejected uh, the Maoist heritage and he has not rejected fully Deng's heritage and not even Jiang's and Hu's heritage. He's building on top of it and he's putting his own sauce uh, to, to, to create that 
bond between those very disparate elements um, and adding some um, Chinese civilization and traditional culture on top of it and nationalism as a spice to, to, to link everything together and to serve that dish to, to the population. So this is, this is something, um, the ability to adjust and adapt and, and reinvent itself is, is really interesting in, in how the, the party state works. That nationalism spice, I think they've used a little too much. It's kind of ruining the flavor of uh, everything else. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, from for, I think from the party's perspective, it has it's a way to replace the the like the Marxist, the pure Marxist uh, ideology. China is not a revolutionary power uh, anymore. Um, there are it's it's this very idiosyncratic composition of elements um there there are bits of that but it's not fully that there are lots of references that are pseudo confucian but they're not a confucian state either um there's lots of references to um like his almost mythical histories of 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 china's glorious past uh, this this need to um, this strive to to get back their place in the world, uh, erase the century of humiliation. So it's a it's a domestic narrative that has a lot of repercussions and implications for China's external behavior. But it's a way also to both uh, bring this coalition or or glue internally domestically and it's a way for the party to create that sense of perpetual crisis which it needs to um to create this sense of unity uh you know there's always something going on there's some always some attack from elsewhere we need to stay together be united in order to confront and survive and and emerge as as the winners of this situation, and if it's not this crisis, it will be an, another crisis. You know, throughout the, the the history of the last few decades, uh, you know, for a while it was Japan, and then it became the U.S. And next time, now it was it was COVID. Next, it w- and and it's India at some times, and sometimes it's Taiwan. I mean, there's always something going on that is both imagined and created um, to 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 provide this uh, ability to have the, the the country knit together because there's no other ideal that the party can provide to its people the the slowing down of its economy has started to erode the ability of the party to say we're going to provide you more with material comfort as compared with the Maoist era when we were just trying to create this revolutionary state now we're going to we're going to give you more um economic comfort material comfort uh, and now that it's eroding then what what is left really well, you need to to serve something to your people uh, when you're uh, a, dict- a dictatorship. You, you still need to have this ideational uh, underpinning of what motivates you to move forward. And nationalism is is the spice and it's the yeah. driver. There are so many directions I'd love to go in from this, but <laughs> I've already taken way too much of your time, Nadej. I've really enjoyed this. Um, thanks so much. Uh, this has been really, really helpful. I think people in the in our audience will will take a lot from it because, um, well, because it, it's really useful. I think your your work is we're, we're going to put on the show page links to your your MBR page and all of the reports and the books and things. Um, what are you working on now? Is there anything that you have coming up soon that uh, will will build on this? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, I'm starting. Uh, in January, a new a new project that's going to try to understand uh, China's 
I call it China's strategic space. So um, it's a bit. Uh, I'm using the the party's own recipes. I'm keeping it broad. I'm not sure the, of the direction of it yet, uh, it, and it will be up to you know, some colleagues of mine to see what we're putting into into it. But. Um, Looking at uh, the region, the 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 way that China wants to reorganize its own periphery and and its own region, I think that's the main idea behind the the project. So maybe in a year from now, I'll be able to tell you more about the the Fantastic. answers to that question. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm such a huge fan. Uh, I have been for years. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank um, you. And look forward to whatever you put out next. Uh, Thank to you our so audience. much for the invitation. Oh, of course. You, you were on the wish, wish list from day one. <laughs> so uh, for all, all of you folks listening, thanks for joining us. Follow us on social media, subscribe, review, and rate us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll see you next month. Produced by HeartCast Media.